Third act, scene. Picture gallery at Huntstanton, door at back leading onto terrace. Lord Dillingworth and Gerald, and Lord Dillingworth lolling on a sofa. Gerald is in a chair. Thoroughly sensible woman, your mother, Gerald. I knew she would come round in the end. Uh, my mother is awfully conscientious, Lord Illingworth, and I know she doesn't think I am educated enough to be your secretary. She is perfectly right, too. I, I was fearfully idle when I was at school, and I couldn't pass an examination now to save my life. My dear Gerald, examinations are of no value whatsoever. If a man is a gentleman, he knows quite enough. And if he is not a gentleman, whatever he knows is bad for him. Uh, but I am so ignorant of the world, Lord Illingworth. Don't be afraid, Gerald. Remember that you've got on your side the most wonderful thing in the world. Youth! There is nothing like youth. The middle-aged are mortgaged to life. The old are in life's lumber room, but youth is the lord of life. Youth has a kingdom waiting for it. Everyone is born a king and most people die in exile like most kings. To win back my youth, Gerald, there is nothing I wouldn't do except take exercise, get up early, or be a useful member of the community. But, you, but don't call yourself old, Lord Illingworth. I am old enough to be your father, Gerald. I don't remember my father. He died years ago. So Lady Hunstanton told me. It is very curious. My mother never talks about, to me about my father. I sometimes think she must have married beneath her. Really? He goes over and puts his hand on Gerald's shoulder. You have missed not having a father, I suppose, Gerald. Oh, no. My mother has been so good to me. No one ever had such a mother as I have had. I am quite sure of that. Still, I should imagine that most mothers don't quite understand their sons. Don't realize I mean that a son has ambitions, a desire to see life, to make himself a name. After all, Gerald, you couldn't be expected to pass all your life in such a hole as Rockley, could you? Oh, no, <laughs> it would be dreadful. A mother's love is very touching, of course, but it's often curiously selfish. I mean, there is a good deal of selfishness in it. I suppose there is. Your mother is a thoroughly good woman. But good women have such limited views of their life. Their horizon is so small. Their interests are so petty, aren't they? They are awfully interested, certainly, in things we don't care much about. I suppose your mother is very religious and that sort of thing. Uh, it's, she's always going to church. Ah, she is not modern, and to be modern is the only thing worth being nowadays. You want to be modern, don't you, Gerald? You want to know life as it really is, not to be put off with any old-fashioned theories about life. Well, what you have to do at present is simply to fit yourself for the best society. A man who can dominate a London dinner table can dominate the world. The future belongs to the dandy. It is the exquisites who are going to rule. I should like to wear nice things awfully, but I, I have always been told that a man should not think too much about his clothes. People nowadays are so absolutely superficial that they don't understand the philosophy of the superficial. By the way, Gerald, you should learn how to tie your tie better. Sentiment is all very well for the buttonhole, but the essential thing for a necktie is style. A well-tied tie is the first serious step in life. <laughs> I, I, I might be able to learn how to tie a tie, Lord Illingworth, but I should never be able to talk as you do. I, I don't know how to talk. Oh, talk to every woman as if you loved her, and to every man as if he bored you, and at the end of your first season you will have the reputation of possessing the most perfect social tact. It is, it is very difficult to get into society, isn't it? To get into the best society nowadays, one has either to feed people, amuse people, or shock people. 
that is all. I suppose society is wonderfully delightful. To be in it is merely a bore, but to be out of it simply a tragedy. Society is a necessary thing. No man has any real success in this world unless he has got women to back him and women rule society. If you've not got women on your side, you are quite over. You might as well be a barrister or a stockbroker or, or a journalist once. It is very difficult to understand women, is it not? You should never try to understand them. Women are pictures. Men are problems. If you want to know what woman really means, which, by the way, is always a dangerous thing to do, look at her, don't listen to her. But women are awfully clever, aren't they? One should always tell them so. But to the philosopher, my dear General, women represent the triumph of matter over mind, just as men represent the triumph of mind over morals. How, then, can women have so much power as you say they have? The history of women is the history of the worst form of tyranny the world has ever known. The tyranny of the weak over the strong it is the only tyranny that lasts. But haven't women got a refining influence? Nothing refines but the intellect. Still, uh, there are uh, many different kinds of women, aren't there? Only two kinds in society, the plain and the coloured. But there are th good women in society, aren't there? Far too many. But do you think women shouldn't be good? One should never tell them so. They'll become good at once. Women are a fascinatingly willful sex. Every woman is a rebel and usually in wild revolt against herself. You have never been married, Lord Illingworth, have you? Men marry because they are tired. Women because they are curious. Both are disappointed. But don't you think one could be happy when one is married? Perfectly happy. But the happiness of a married man, my dear Gerald, depends <laughs> on if he has not married. But if one is in love? One should always be in love. That is the reason one should never marry. And that love is a very wonderful thing, isn't it? When one is love, one begins by deceiving oneself, and one ends by deceiving others. That is what the world calls a romance. But really, grand passion is comparatively rare nowadays. It is the privilege of people who have nothing to do. That is the one use of the idle classes in the country and the only possible explanation of us Harfords. Harfords, Lord Ellingworth? That is my family name. You should study the peerage, Gerald. It is the one book a young man about town should know thoroughly, and it is the best thing in fiction the English have ever done. And now, Gerald, you are going into a perfectly new life with me, and I want you to know how to live. Mrs. Arbuthnot appears on terrace behind. For the world has been made by fools that wise men should live in it. Enter Lady Hunstanton and Dr. de Borney. Ah, oh, here you are, dear Lord Illingworth. Well, I suppose you've been telling our young friend, Gerald, what his new duties are to be, and giving him a great deal of good advice over a pleasant cigarette. I have been giving him the best of advice, Lady Hustinson, and the best of cigarettes. I am so sorry I was not here to listen to you, but I suppose I am too old now to learn. Except from you, dear Archdeacon, when you are in your nice pulpit. But then I always know what you are going to say, so I don't feel alarmed. She sees Dr. Mrs. Arbuthnot. Ah, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot, do come and join us. Come, dear. Enter Mrs. Arbuthnot. Gerald has been having such a long talk with Lord Illingworth. I am sure you must feel very much flattered at the pleasant way in which everything has turned out for him. Let, let us sit down. And, sit down. And how is your beautiful embroidery going on? I am always at work, Lady Hunstanton. Mrs. Daubney embroiders a little, doesn't she? Um, she was very deft with her needlework once. Quite Dorcas, 
but the gout has crippled her fingers a good deal. She has not touched the timber frame for nine or ten years, but she has many other amusements. She is very much interested in her own health. Oh, that is always a nice distraction, is it not? Now, what were you talking about, Lord Illingworth? Do tell us. I was on the point of explaining to Gerald that the world has always laughed at its own tragedies, being the only way in which it has been able to bear them. And that, consequently, whatever the world has treated seriously belongs to the comedy side of things. Now I'm quite out of my depth. I usually am when Lord Illingworth says anything. And the Humane Society is most careless. They never rescue me. I am left to sink. I have a dim idea, Lord Illingworth, that you are always on the side of the sinners. And I know that I always try to be on the side of the saints, but that is as far as I get. And after all, it may merely be the fancy of a drowning person. The only difference between the saint and the sinner is that every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. Ah, that quite does for me. I haven't a word to say. You and I, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot, are behind the age. We can't follow Lord Illingworth. Too much care was taken with our education, I am afraid. To have been well brought up is a great drawback nowadays. It shuts one out from so much. Now, I should be sorry to follow Lord Illingworth in any of his opinions. You are quite right, dear. Gerald shrugs his shoulders and looks irritably over at his mother. Enter Lady Caroline. Jane, have you seen John anywhere? You needn't be anxious about him, dear. He is with Lady Stutfield. I saw them some time ago in the yellow drawing room. They seem quite happy together. You, you are not going, Caroline. Pray sit down. I think I had better look after John. Exit Lady Caroline. It doesn't do to pay men so much attention. And Caroline has really nothing to be anxious about. Lady Stutfield is very sympathetic. She is just as sympathetic about one thing as she is about another. A beautiful nature. And to Sir John and Mrs Allenby. Ah, here is Sir John. And with Mrs Allenby too. I suppose it was with... I suppose it was Mrs Allenby I saw him with. Sir John, Caroline has been looking everywhere for you. We have been waiting for her in the music room, dear Lady Hunstanton. <gasps> the music room, of course. I thought it was the yellow drawing room. But my memory is getting so defective. Mrs Daubney has a wonderful memory, hasn't she, Archdeacon? She used to be quite remarkable for her memory, but since her last attack she recalls chiefly the events of her early childhood. <gasps> but she finds great pleasure in such retrospections. Great pleasure. And to Lady Stutfield and Mr. Kelville. Oh, dear Lady Stutfield, and what has Mr. Kelville been talking to you about? About bimetallism, as well as I can remember. Bimetallism? Is that quite a nice subject? However, I know people discuss everything very freely nowadays, and... What did Sir John talk to you about, Mrs Allenby? About Patagonia. Really? What a remote topic, but very improving, I have no doubt. He has been most interesting on the subject of Patagonia. Savages seem to have quite the same views as cultured people on almost all subjects. They are excessively advanced. What do they do? Apparently, everything. Well, it is very gratifying, dear Archdeacon, is it not, to find that human nature is permanently one. On the whole, the world is the same world, is it not? The world is simply divided into two classes. Those who believe the incredible, like the public, and those who do the improbable. Like yourself? Yes. I am always astonishing myself. It's the only thing that makes life worth living. What have you been doing lately that astonishes you? I have been discovering all kinds of beautiful qualities in my own nature. Oh, don't become quite perfect all at once. 
do it gradually. I don't intend to grow perfect at all. At least, I hope I shan't. It would be most inconvenient. Women love us for our defects. If we have enough of them, they will forgive us everything, even our gigantic intellects. It is premature to ask us to forgive analysis. We forgive adoration. That is quite as much as should be expected from us. Enter Lord Alfred. He joins Lady Stutfield. We women should forgive everything, shouldn't we, dear Mrs Arbuthnot? I am sure you agree with me in that. I do not, Lady Anne Stanton. I think there are many things women should never forgive. What, what sort of things? The ruin of another woman's life. She moves slowly away to the back of the stage. Ah, oh, those things are very sad, no doubt, but I believe that there are admirable homes where people of that kind are looked after and reformed. And I think, on the whole, that the secret to life is to take things very, very easily. The secret of life is never to have an emotion that is unbecoming. The secret of life is to appreciate the pleasure of being terribly, terribly deceived. The secret of life is to resist temptation, Lady Stutfield. There is no secret of life. Life's aim, if it has one, is simply to be always looking for temptations. There are not nearly enough. I sometimes pass a whole day without coming across a single one. It is quite dreadful. It makes one so nervous about the future. Lady Hunt Stanton shakes her fan at him. I don't know how it is, dear Lord Illingworth, but everything you have said today to me seems excessively immoral. It has been most interesting listening to you. All thought is immoral. Its very essence is destruction. If you think of anything, you kill it. Nothing survives being thought of. I don't understand a word, Lord Illingworth, but I have no doubt that it is all quite true. Personally, I have very little to reproach myself with on the score of thinking. I don't believe in women thinking too much. Women should think in moderation, as they should do all things in moderation. Moderation is a fatal thing, Lady Hustinson. Nothing succeeds like excess. <laughs> I hope I shall remember that. It sounds an admirable maxim, but I'm beginning to forget everything. It's such a great misfortune. <laughs> it is one of your most fascinating qualities, Lady Hustinson. No woman should have a memory. Memory in a woman is the beginning of dowdiness. One can always tell from a woman's bonnet whether she's got a memory or not. <laughs> How charming you are, dear Lord Illingworth. You always find out that one's most glaring fault is one's most important virtue. You have the most comforting views of life. Enter Farquhar. Dr. Daubney's carriage. My dear Archdeacon, it is only half past ten. I'm afraid I must go, Lady Hunstanton. Tuesday is always one of Mrs. Daubney's bad nights. Well, I won't keep you from her. She goes with him towards the door. I have told Farquhar to put a brace of partridge into the carriage. Mrs. Daubney may fancy them. It is very kind of you, but Mrs. Daubney never touches solids now. Lives entirely on jellies. But she, she is wonderfully cheerful. Wonderfully cheerful. She has nothing to complain of. Exit with Lady Hunstanton. Mrs Allenby goes over to Lord Illingworth. There is a beautiful moon tonight. Let us go and look at it. To look at anything that is inconstant is charming nowadays. You have your looking glass. It is unkind. It merely shows me my wrinkle. Mine is better behaved. It never tells me the truth. Then it is in love with you. Exit Sir John, Lady Stutfield, Mr. Kelville and Lord Alfred. May I come too? Do, my dear boy. He moves towards with Mrs. Um, Allenby and Gerald. 
Lady Caroline enters, looking rapidly round and goes off in the opposite direction to that taken by Sir John and Lady Stutfield. Gerald? What, Mother? Exit Lord Illingworth with Mrs Allenby. It's, it's getting late. Let us go home. Oh, my dear Mother, do let us wait a little longer. Lord Illingworth is so delightful and... By the way, Mother, I have a great surprise for you. We are starting for India at the end of the month. Let us go home. If you really want to, of course, Mother. But I must bid goodbye to Lord Illingworth first. I'll be back in five minutes. He exits. Let him leave me if he chooses. But not with him, not with him. I, I couldn't bear it. She walks up and down. Enter Hester. What a lovely night it is, Mrs Arbuthnot. Is it? Mrs Arbuthnot, I wish you would let us be friends. You are so different from the other women here. When you came into the drawing room this evening, somehow you brought with you a sense of what is good and pure in life. I had been foolish. There are things that are right to say, but that may be said at the wrong time and to the wrong people. I heard what you said. I agree with it, Miss Walsley. I didn't know you had heard it. But I knew you would agree with me. A woman who has sinned should be punished, shouldn't she? Yes. She shouldn't be allowed to come into the society of good men and women? She should not. And the man should be punished in the same way? In the same way. And the children. If there are children. In the same way also. Yes. It is right that the sins of the parents should be visited on the children. It is a just law. It is God's law. It is one of God's terrible laws. She moves away to the fireplace. You are distressed about your son leaving you, Mrs Arbuthnot? Yes. Do you like him going away with Lord Illingworth? Of course, there is position, no doubt, and money. But position and, and money are not everything. Are they? They are nothing. They bring misery. Then why do you let your son go with him? He wishes it himself. But if you asked him, he would stay, would he not? He has his heart set on going. He couldn't refuse you anything. He loves you too much. Ask him to stay. Let me send him in to you. He is on the terrace at the moment with Lord Illingworth. I have heard them laughing together as I pass through the music room. Don't trouble, Mrs. Bo Miss Worsley. I can wait. It is of no consequence. No, I'll tell him you want him. Do. Do ask him to stay. Exit Hester. He won't, he won't come. I know he won't come. Enter Lady Caroline. She looks around anxiously. Enter Gerald. Mr Arbuthnot, may I ask you, is Sir John anywhere on the terrace? Uh, no, Lady Caroline, he is not on the terrace. It is very curious. It is time for him to retire. Exit Lady Caroline. Dear Mother, I am afraid I kept you waiting. I forgot all about it. I am so happy tonight, Mother. I, I have never been so happy. At, at the prospect of going away? Uh, don't put it like that, Mother. Of course I am sorry to leave you. Why, you are the best mother in the world. But after all, as Lord Illingworth says, it is impossible to live in such a place as Rockley. You don't mind it. But I'm ambitions. I want something more than that. I want to have a career. I want to do something that will make you proud of me. And Lord Illingworth is going to help me. He's going to do everything for me. Gerald, don't go away with Lord Illingworth. I implore you, do not. Gerald, I beg you. Mother, how changeable you are. Uh, you don't seem to know your own mind for a single moment. An hour and a half ago in the drawing room, you agreed to the whole thing. Now you turn around and make objections and try to force me to give up my one chance in life. Yes, my one chance. 
You don't suppose that men like Lord Illingworth are to be found every day, do you, Mother? It is very strange that when I have such wonderful piece of good luck, the one person to put difficulties in my way should be my own mother. Besides, you know, Mother, I love Hester Worsley. Who could help loving her? I love her more than I have ever told you, far more. And if I had a position, if I had a prospects, I, 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 could, I could ask her to... Don't you understand now, Mother, what it means to be Lord Illingworth's secretary? To start like that is to find a career ready for one, before one, waiting for one. If I were Lord Illingworth's secretary, I could ask Hester to be my wife, as a wretched bank clerk with a hundred a year would be an impertinence. I fear you need have no hopes, at Mrs. Miss Worsley. I know her views on life. She has just told them to me. Then I have my ambition left, at any rate. That is something. I am glad I have that. You have always tried to crush my ambition, Mother, haven't you? You have told me that the world is a wicked place, that success is not worth having, that society is shallow and all that sort of thing. Well, I don't believe it, Mother. I think the world must be delightful. I think society must be exquisite. I think success is a thing worth having. You have been wrong in all that you have taught me, Mother. Quite wrong. Lord Ellingworth is a successful man. He is a fashionable man. He is a man who lives in the world and for it. Well, I would give anything to be just like Lord Ellingworth. I would sooner see you dead. Mother, what is your objection to Lord Ellingworth? Tell me, tell me right out, what is it? He is a bad man. In what way bad? I don't understand what you mean. I will not tell you. Oh, I suppose Sorry, you I think will, you... Or I will change my mind and I will tell you. <laughs> I, I suppose you think him bad because he doesn't believe the same things as you do. Well, men are different from women, Mother. It is natural that they should have different views. It is not what Lord Illingworth believes, or what he does not believe, that makes him bad. It is what he is. Mother, is it something you know of him? Something you actually know? It is something I know. Something you are quite sure of? Quite sure of. How long have you known it? For 20 years. Is it fair to go back 20 years in any man's career? And what have you or I to do with Lord Illingworth's early life? What business is it, is it of ours? What this man has been, he is now. And will be always. Mother, tell me what Lord Illingworth did. If he did anything shameful, I will not go away with him. Surely you know me well enough for that. Gerald, come near to me. Quite close to me. As you used to do when you were a little boy. When you were mother's own boy. Gerald sits down beside his mother. She runs his feet, her fingers through his hair and strokes his hands. Gerald, there was once a girl. She was very young. She was a little over 18 at the time. George Harford, that was Lord Inningwen's name then. George Harford met her. She knew nothing about his life. He knew everything. He made love to this girl. He made her love him so much that she left her father's house with him one morning. She loved him so much and he promised to marry her. He had solemnly promised to marry her. 
and she had believed him. She was very young and, and ignorant of what life really is. But he put the marriage off from week to week and month to month. She trusted in him all the while. She loved him. Before her child was born, before she had a child, she implored him for the child's sake to marry her, that the child might have a name, that her sin might not be visited on the child who was innocent. He refused. After the child was born, she left him, taking the child away and her life was ruined and her soul ruined and all that was sweet and good and pure in her ruined also. She suffered terribly. She suffers now. She will always suffer. For her, there is no joy no peace, no atonement. She is a woman who drags a chain like a guilty thing. She is a woman who wears a mask like a thing that is a leper. The fire cannot purify her. The waters cannot quench her anguish. Nothing can heal her. No anodyne can give her a sleep. No poppy's forgetfulness. She is lost. She is a lost soul. That is why I called Lord anyone a bad man. That is why I don't want my boy to be with him. My dear mother, it, it, it all sounds very tragic, of course. But I dare say the girl was just as much to blame as Lord Illingworth was. After all, would a really nice girl, a girl with any nice feelings at all, go away from her home with a man to whom she was not married and live with him as his wife? No nice girl would. Gerald, I withdraw all my objections. You are at liberty to go away with Lord Illingworth when and where you choose. Oh, dear mother, I knew you wouldn't stand in my way. You're the best woman God ever made. And as for Lord Anyworth, I don't believe he is capable of doing anything infamous or base. I, I, I can't believe it in him, I can't. Let me go, let me go. And Hester in terror and rushes over to Gerald and flings herself in his arms. Oh, save me, save me from him. From, from whom? He has insulted me, horribly insulted me. Save me. Who? Who has dared? Lord Illingworth enters at back of stage. Hester breaks from Gerald's arms and points to him. Gerald is quite beside himself with rage and indignation. Lord Illingworth, you have insulted the purest thing on God's earth. I think as pure as my own mother. You have insulted the woman I love most in the world with my own mother. As there is God in heaven, I will kill you. No, no. Don't hold me, mother. Don't hold me. I'll kill him. Gerald. Let me go, I say. Stop. Gerald, stop. He is your father. Gerald clutches his mother's hands and looks into her face. She sinks slowly onto the ground in shame. Hester steals towards the door. Lord Illingworth frowns and bites his lips. After a time, Gerald raises his mother up, puts his arms round her and leads her from the room. End of act. <laughs>